Hello everyone, this is Dr. Shijun Wang. In today's video, I am going to share my experiences on memorization. Um, to start this topic, I want to really share some really funny stories. Uh, first of all, my Julia professor, uh, Oksana Yablonskaya, she once told me that if you ever meet people who claims that they've never had memory slips. Uh, either they're lying or they don't perform much. Um, really, memory slips is something that even the top-notch, the first-class performers all have to face and sometimes all experience. Um, I was fortunate enough to witness the uh, performance of Andre Schiff uh, entire Beethoven sonata uh, performances at Carnegie. This was probably 2008 or nine. This is, you know, more than 10 years ago. Um, on the last concert, on the last recital, uh, he was performing the last late sonatas and on Opus 110, first movement, Mr. Schiff had a big memory problem. He couldn't find the next chord. Um, and what's interesting is that he, you know, finally got out of, of the uh, memory problem, but it's the first part of the exposition. He went back because there was a repeat sign. Probably he tried to prove himself or prove that he knows the, <laughs> the course, but then when he reaches the same spot, again, the memory problem appears. So he had to struggle and uh, try really hard to get out of that uh, memory problem. Well, why do I say that? Even, I mean, Mr. Schiff is probably one of the best musicians living today, and he has to face that problem too. Um, and also, Murray Pryor, yeah, one of my favorite, again, living artists. Um, and this is really a story that's shared by one of my Julia professors who, who told me that when he was a DMA student at Peabody, um, Mr. Pryor often goes to perform for a group of DMA students and, and Peabody professors on the first performance of a new program. And he has memory problem, he has technical difficulties in those concerts, like a very close little concerts. Um, and then of course, later on, he performs a hundred times and when he does this a hundredth time at Carnegie, it's perfect, yeah? So I've actually never heard Mr. Pryor perform for the first time on a new piece. But from what I heard that, you know, he's a human being, he has problems, he has memory slips, you know, that makes us feel better because then everyone is human. Okay, but today's topic is to share my experience of how to memorize a piece, okay? Um, in general, there are two ways. Number one is muscle memory. Number two is, you know, bring memory like you remember what the notes or next chorus or next harmony is. Um, you've probably heard many, many people saying that muscle memory is not reliable. I don't deny it, it's correct. You cannot only depend on muscle memory because muscle memory will change when you play on a different piano or even the, when your your body is in a different stage. Yeah, when you're on the stage, you're nervous, your blood pressure is high, your heart is bumping like crazy, you feel that everything is slow, even though you're playing presto to everything. Um, so in that case, muscle memory you know, can be really, really uh, unstable. And here, let me share with you a story told by a, a, another very great uh, perfo uh, professional pianist. Um, he told me that years ago, yeah, when the Chinese national ping pong team was not 
dominating like it is today or in the past 20 or 30 years, um, they often lose to their rivals. Um, and the coach was really confused right? because they practiced the same ball hitting for thousands of times, but it's always 100% when they're in a practice session. But whenever they're having an important match, then the players often make mistakes. Um, and actually a cameraman who caught the real reason behind this is because when the players are in the real match, they're more nervous, so they lift their shoulders. When they do that, the whole angle of you know the pedal and the ball changes so that you know they make mistakes. So after that, you know, every time when the players are facing some important matches, the coach always reminds them, drop your shoulders, drop your shoulders. Doesn't that sound familiar? Because when we teach kids, we always say, drop your shoulders. But, you know, sometimes maybe even us, when we go on stage, go on to uh, perform on, on a stage, then we're nervous that unconsciously we change, right? Our body change. Uh, the gesture or posture so that, you know, uh, memory, uh, muscle memory, you know, can, can be affected. However, um, it's not right to say you never should depend on muscle memory, okay? When we have fast running passages, we have to depend on muscle memory. Yeah, because simply put, we move our hands faster than we think in our brain. Yeah. So if or when we play fast moving things like this, well, first of all, I've heard probably a thousand different versions of people performing this. Never once they have memory slip. Yeah. They 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 miss notes, but they never have memory slip. Yeah. Because everyone learned this with you know the hand positions yeah you don't you don't forget that um or things like this yeah that's how you practice it so that you know memory slip can greatly help but in other cases yeah for instance when the music is slow then muscle memory is risky okay also muscle memory doesn't work as well when we play left hand, yeah, left hand most of the time has harmonies, and it has up and down gesture. Yeah. It has a lot of going down to the bass. We hear so many times that students miss the bass. Why is that? Because you see, muscle memory works best when it's fast and when it's close positioned. But when you have to jump from one point to another point, yeah, do you go to here or a little bit further or a little bit closer? That's hard to be 100%, right? If that's always reliable, then every basketball player will <laughs> make the shot, right? Because everyone knows the goal is to put the ball into the basket. But then when you're shooting from long distance, the accuracy rate drops. Yeah, same here. When it's larger than an octave, when it requires you to jump or to leap, then it's not reliable. So you have to know what the notes are. Okay, um, and also harmony. Um, why is it important to know the harmony? Because harmony has has habits. There are uh, regulations of harmony. There are uh, the same harmonic progressions that all composers use, like, like two, five, one, or dominant, resolving to tonic. If you know the harmony, you might miss notes. You might play in the wrong uh, chord progression, uh, chord position, but you will know what's going on. Yeah. Um, last year, I started learning the fourth ballad, and for a piano teacher my age, I'm in my mid-30, to learn a new piece is never easy. Uh, I have kids to take care of, I have students to, <laughs> to, 
to teach, and then I have all other duties and obligations in the university. I have probably one hour or two hours of my own to practice. So the fourth ballad, it took me a long time to get familiar with notes, and I always got confused of, of the, the beginning. You feel like, or you feel like the notes is just circling around <laughs> in, in one place. And not after I analyze the, uh, the harmonic progression that I, you know, feel suddenly enlightened. The whole thing just has two chords. One, the tonic, and then a diminish. So, and of course with a pedal point. Yeah, and then, and then it goes to a another uh, key, but a major key, but using the same harmonic progression. One diminished seven, one diminished seven. So the opening of that part no longer is tricky to me and with confident I will never forget it. Yeah, because that's quite standard harmonic progressions. Okay, and here I want to share with you a very stunning story that I experienced. Yeah, this was in 2010 in the Music Academy of the West in Santa Barbara, uh, a town, this is a super nice town, about an hour away from LA. Um, it's still probably a, you know, one of the most selective and high quality music festival of, of you know, of the States. Uh, they select only 10 pianists per year and you are not allowed to go to the next time because the festival wants to benefit more pianists. So I was lucky enough to be selected uh, 12 years ago. And then the professor who taught there for many, many decades was Mr. Lowenthal. Um, and he performs many concerts during that two months long uh, residency. And once he performed the Kinder's Island in, uh, I think in July, uh, and I never learned that piece back then. And he performed it beautifully. Yeah, he studied with William Capel and, and Koto. So really the, <laughs> the version of him playing the, Sh the Schumann piece really give me shimmers, shimmerings that maybe that's just Koto himself playing. Um, and after the concert, we had parties with donors. Yeah, there's always party in Santa Barbara. Um, and one of the donors asked him if he could improvise for us. And the answer from Ms. Lowenthal is so witty. He said, if you haven't heard, if you think you haven't heard me uh, improvising, you've already did. Because the concert an hour ago, I was improvising the left hand the whole time because he only knew the chord progressions. He didn't know the exact position of the chords. So he could well be playing this when Schumann wanted that, right? He doesn't have a lot of time to practice, to perform, but he has the guts to perform in front of so many pianists and donors and everyone in town only knowing the harmonic progression. It's really stunning. I don't know how he did it. And I'm sure everyone in the room who knows how difficult that is was impressed. Yeah. So that's a proven method of the most reliable memorization tool. That is to know the harmony. And of course, sometimes when we face something difficult, contemporary, uh, I had once taught a student who was playing a barber nocturne. Um, and, you know, it's a tono, it's not, I mean, it's a beautiful piece, but you don't, you know, use the uh, tonal an analyzation of tonic, subdominant, and dominant to, to analyze that. And the student was really struggling. So later on, I suggested her to use solfege 
to help. So when he when she practiced, I asked her, "You have to sing sausage with the melody," um, and that worked. So she 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 later told me that she had very firm uh, memory because when she plays, she also sings the sausage, and when the finger hesitates, she knows the next one is E or it's A or it's D because the mouse also know. So I guess in that sense, she had triple insurance: the muscle memory, the mind. The brain memory and also the mouse memory, whatever you call it, yeah. So again, memorization is difficult. It's something that every professional musician worry about, <laughs> yeah.、Um, so the only way to make sure that you have full confidence is to fully prepare, and is to perform it as many times. As possible, yeah. In in music conservatories, we have these performance classes. We have studio classes. That weekly, you have a opportunity to perform in front of your peers. And I often perform in those when I was a student. And sometimes I miss miserably. I miss notes. I I have memory problems. But that's when you grow, yeah. So that the tenth time. You perform the same piece is on a important stage. It's for the real jury. It's for a competition. It's for a concert. Yeah. So really, never be afraid to perform in front of other people, but always be prepared to perform a new piece and by performing as many times as you can. I hope these will help you with this difficult journey of memorizing a new piece. Thank you for watching. See you next time.